When we assess the acutely ill patient, we're going to start off with the goal of identifying and treating immediate life threats. That's going to be the mantra we repeat to ourselves while we're taking care of this patient. And we're going to accomplish that by performing an A, B, C, D assessment on each and every patient, each and every time. Whenever somebody's sick, we want to say, oh my. That stands for oxygen, monitor, and IV access. Oxygen, obviously, to help with breathing. Monitor, so we can keep tabs on what's going on with the patient. And IV access, so we can treat them if they need it. Like I mentioned before, the goal with sick patients is simultaneous assessment and treatment. So while we're assessing our patient, if we identify a life threat, we don't want to just keep going along and assessing them. We want to address that life threat immediately. This is not the time to sit down and take a leisurely history and perform a physical exam and then start thinking about treatment. We need to be able to do everything all at once to get the ball rolling for our patient and get them stabilized as rapidly as we can. So we're gonna start off talking about the ABC assessment. And as you've probably heard before, ABC stands for airway, breathing, and circulation. When we think about the airway, clearly anybody who's talking, that's a good sign. They have a patent airway. But even for a patient who's able to speak and phonate normally, they could possibly have future airway obstruction, and we wanna be prepared to deal with that. So look for signs of edema, either in the face or the pharynx. Look for blood, vomit, or other foreign material in the airway, and listen to their breathing, not with a stethoscope, but just with your naked ear. Anytime a, a patient is breathing in a way that's noisy or easily audible, that's obstructed breathing, and the louder it is, the more concerned that you should be. Regarding breathing, the best thing we can do is just get a gestalt sense of how hard the patient is working to breathe. If the patient is using the muscles in their neck and in their chest, and if they're doing push-ups when they try to breathe, those are all signs that they could potentially have impending respiratory failure because they're not gonna be able to maintain that high level of work of breathing indefinitely. We wanna listen to their breath sounds and we want to check their pulse ox. The pulse ox is the single most important vital sign for breathing. The whole purpose of the lungs is to get oxygen into the bloodstream. And even if the patient looks and sounds great, if they're hypoxic, you've got a problem with B. Lastly, we want to check circulation. So part of circulation is just a general gestalt look at the patient. If the patient is maintaining well and they're nice and pink, that's a really good sign that they're perfusing their brains and the rest of their bodies adequately. Whereas if they're pale, cyanotic, altered, they may potentially not be perfusing as well as we'd hope. We also want to feel peripheral pulses. Now, clearly, a patient who's awake and talking to you obviously has a carotid pulse, right? They must be perfusing their brain. But if they have a weak or absent peripheral pulse, that's something that we want to be aware of because that could tell us potentially that they're not perfusing their uh, uh, the periphery as well as we'd hope. We also want to look at their vital signs, the heart rate, the cardiac rhythm, the blood pressure. These all give us important clues about the adequacy of circulation. So let's start off with A and B. Now, A and B are usually assessed together, and the vast majority of A and B problems are really B problems. They're usually caused by pulmonary disease rather than primary airway emergencies, although we do look at the two things together. So again, respiratory rate is an important, res is an important vital sign for A and B. Um, a patient who's breathing very quickly, you want to be concerned about the possibility that they're going to tire out and not be able to sustain that respiratory rate. Pulse ox, we already mentioned, is absolutely critical. It's the most important vital sign for A and B. And again, that work of breathing. If a patient is using a lot of metabolic energy to get air into their lungs, they're not going to be able to sustain that indefinitely, meaning that they're not going to be able to consider continue oxygenating and ventilating normally in the long run. And they're at risk for developing respiratory failure. Anytime you suspect a problem with airway or breathing, the first step is to administer supplemental oxygen. This will help address the hypoxia and will hopefully help reduce the work of breathing as well, allowing the patient to oxygenate with less effort. Um, you want to be ready to manage the airway. That's not to say that every single patient needs to be intubated right this minute, but you want to have the necessary equipment, medications, and personnel available so that if you do need to manage the airway, you'll be ready. 
You want to auscultate the lungs, and that's really important because auscultation doesn't tell you if there's a problem with airway and breathing, but it can help tell you why. It can help narrow your differential. So if your patient is wheezing, you're going to manage them differently than if they have crackles versus if they have unilaterally absent breath sounds. So different lung sounds are going to help us understand what the underlying problem is and treat it accordingly. And then lastly, we want to get a stat chest x-ray. Any patient with any degree of respiratory distress deserves to have a picture of their lungs so we can get a better sense of what's going on with them physiologically. Let's move on to C. So we already mentioned some of the things we want to check for C. I want to also stress the importance of vital signs for circulatory assessment. So anytime a patient is tachycardic, there's one of two things going on. Either A, they're having a cardiac dysrhythmia and you want to make sure that you address that rhythm disturbance as a primary disease process. Or two, if they're in sinus tachycardia, so their cardiac rhythm is normal, but their heart rate is fast, then you want to recognize that they are trying to physiologically compensate for some underlying derangement. And you want to figure out what that derangement is and take care of it. Blood pressure is kind of like pulse ox, right? It's the bottom line on circulation. It's the bottom line for C. The whole point of the circulatory system is to send blood to the vital organs. And if your blood pressure is low, then the perfusion pressure for those vital organs is going to be low, meaning that your circulation is inadequate. So even for a patient with a normal heart rhythm and rate, if they're hypotensive, we have a C problem and we need to take care of it. Anytime we suspect a problem with C, we want to make sure we get two large bore IV catheters, not one, but two. And that's so important because we want to make sure that we have the ability to rapidly infuse fluid or blood products if the patient needs it. And in the event that one of our IVs infiltrates or falls out, we want to always have a backup so that we're not facing interruptions or obstacles in trying to treat our critically ill patient. We want to make sure that we get a good look at the monitor and differentiate those patients who have non-sinus from those who have sinus rhythms. And again, if they have a non-sinus rhythm, we want to think about treating it. And lastly, we want to consider IV fluids. Now, not every single patient with a circulatory abnormality needs IV fluids, but the vast majority will benefit. There are some cases like cardiogenic shock where the underlying problem is really pump failure. The heart's not squeezing adequately to perfuse the body. That's a situation where fluid isn't going to benefit you. But in the vast majority of cases, filling up the tank or optimizing intravascular volume is going to be the first step in stabilizing C.